So, bismillah walhamdulillah wassalat wassalam ala sayyid al-mursaleen muhammadin al-amin amma ba'd. Uh, so, uh, dear brother Charles, today I want to talk about, I guess, science and Islamic epistemology. And, um, and the way I would like to start off is to share with you uh, what we learned in terms of our teachers, our tradition. Mm -hmm particularly in the Indian subcontinent, how the scholars looked at the subject of science and how they understood it uh, in terms of its unfolding to the world. Sure. So, <clears throat> bismillah. Okay, so the first thing is, uh, let me just discuss with you what Iqbal says. Iqbal, uh, who is the teacher, by the way, of Muhammad Asad? So that just to put a context of, of who he is. Iqbal was the par excellence intellectual of the uh, Muslims of the Indian subcontinent. Right. And uh, so what Iqbal basically describes is he says that the Western civilization has two parts. There's the dazzling exterior, which is their culture, their entertainment, their their art, their their culture. And he says and their technology, you know, which is and their technology that's what's really dazzling people nowadays. The rest of it is a little less no, I mean this is even more important for Muslims early on because when they saw the trains, because everything was an agrarian society in the Muslim world. The Ottoman Empire was agrarian. And all of a sudden the Muslim world's like, oh there's a train and there's this and this is like wow wow i mean there there i think from what we learned from our teachers and what i read in some of the writings that when the muslims in the indian subcontinent for example they saw all this technology coming in and the culture with it coming in they were maybe more impressed than we would be with the new technology today i mean that was like yeah. really Right. Well, it was more of a of an abrupt break. I, I remember reading uh, the Seven Pillars of Wisdom by uh, T. E. Lawrence about how the Bedouins, you know, were responding to, to the military technology that was suddenly appearing. Airplanes, you know, never saw airplanes before, yeah. and then these things were flying over and dropping bombs on you, you know, and that's pretty, you know, and uh, there was a, hu a huge airplane flew in, you know, uh, and. and uh, you know, one of the better better ones was, or the better ones were saying, "Well, uh, th th this is prob probably the mother plane." You know, and the smaller planes are like the calves. You know, pr probably semi humorously, but you know, what did they have to compare it to? You know, but but you know, large large cows and little calves. You know, because they haven't seen anything like it. Yeah, and so and and that's what happened in the Muslim world is that in this break, right, that you're talking about. Um, reminds me of a few verses of the Quran because there's a there's a verse of Quran that kind of like talks about this in a very interesting way and maybe I'll take your take on that if I remember to come back to it. But when the Muslim world was hit by what specifically was there in the form of the East Western uh, East West India Company and uh, the the and then later on the the conquest of the British. The Muslims, so so Iqbal, okay, so let me go back to Iqbal, says the dazzling exterior. So this is the exterior. And he says the core, though, the core is Quranic in the sense that it says don't, don't rely on superstition, but rely on what your eyes can observe and what your ears can hear and what you see of the natural world. And so Iqbal feels that through Spain and the universities in Spain, Muslim Spain, the West inherited this kind of like non-dogmatic way of looking at nature. And that became the core of their success mm -hmm. in the long term. And the so, Greeks might have had that to begin with, but by the time... Greek wisdom got to the Christian Middle Ages, it was all like dogma, you know, this is what Galen says, this is what Aristotle says, this is what, you know, and we just accept it, and we don't, you know, uh, 
to, to, to the experimental method was considered sort of impious at one point. You know, so. so the so so that's how Iqbal saw the West. That the that even uh, one of the scholars, I forget his name right now, a very famous scholar um in the Indian subcontinent, he also felt that the West has basically taken some of the precepts of Islam when it comes to epistemology specifically. Taken the precepts of Islam when it comes to epistemology and applied them to their own civilization, but then wrapped, now I'm using Iqbal's term, wrapped that epistemology with a lot of glitter that makes dunya look very appealing. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's what Western civilization has lost, and maybe all civilizations to some degree, but we can no longer make the, the, the world appealing as an alternative to God, because obviously everything is falling apart. You know, our, our, uh, we, we, we're seeing signs of the beginning breakup of even our technological civilization, which is what we're, everything was sacrificed for technology. Mm -hmm. All the other values were sacrificed for technology. And now technology is, is beginning to show that it cannot exist without those values. Mm -hmm. Like artificial intelligence will destroy human intelligence and then fall because there's there are no human beings to keep it going. You know, this, this kind of thing. And or, or, or even uh, we, we, we have 5G phone networks that, that are jeopardizing other kinds of technology that, that, that are actually, you know, uh, uh, in interfering with with the ability of, of airplanes to navigate and such so it's it's getting to a point where you know and, and it has to, it has to move ahead for economic reasons right yeah um, yes. but it's it's not uh you know it's not viable in the long run in the long term so. yeah the smartest thing for human civilization is really to put brake on technology and just kind of like sit back and like re-look at where are we going but no one's going to do that because that's i mean they're just not going to do that and so it is all about money i mean if you have a, a truck that's driving 24 7 not going to have accidents and you have a robot driving it and you don't need it to rest like a human being after every eight hours you know uh they have ai that now beats lawyers in lawyer exams the bar exams you know mm -hmm. And so, anyway, so coming back to the issue of Quran and epistemology and science. So, as far as, uh, so, so I, I was mentioning this as in terms of the Muslims and their, the Muslim intellectuals, how they saw the rise of the West, that they're doing basically in terms of knowledge of observation of the universe, pretty much according to the Islamic tradition. Okay. But in Islam, you can say that they, but, but it was happening at a much more, I don't know, that thing that you just described as that break, right? Mm -hmm. Where it was more about domination, maybe, uh, technology specifically for domination over the earth. Yeah, the domination of nature. I mean, the, the idea, I mean, you know, medieval Christianity had the idea of uh, the, sci the signs of, uh, of, you know, the, the forms of nature as the signs of God. You know, that, that was all there. It's, it's even in, uh, in St. Paul's epistles, you know, that, that, that the, 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 the hidden things of, of God are made known through the forms of nature. You know, and that, that was there, but um, somehow there was a divergence b between that, that attitude and the uh, utilitarian uh, appro approach to technology. So the, 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 there, was no, there was no point where you say, well, you know, if, if we create this technology, we're, we are violating uh, the natural world, you know, the and, and it our study of the natural world is what gave us an understanding of the natural laws that allowed us to create this technology. And then we're going to go around and violate the very yeah. laws by which this technology was made. This is not, you know, is not a good idea. That's actually a very, very important point you just mentioned. 
that we first got into this to learn about nature, right? That, and that, that's and now we're trying to change nature itself. Right. Um, the, the old name for science in the West was natural philosophy. That's precisely what it was. <coughs> and, and, you know, the, 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 the study of nature, study of the science was the study of nature. And then secondarily, we see how some of the, the operations of nature work and, and we, we can develop a technology based upon that. But now technology is like a world into itself, which is supposedly, which is which is all a delusion ultimately, but supposedly will allow us to forget nature completely and just live in a world of technology, like a metaverse, you know. Mm -hmm. And that that is a, that, that's you know lethal. You know that's 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 the beginning of the end. Once once you start to say that, so so this verse is very important in this subject. Uh, I number. 53 of Sutul Fusilat, uh, many, many scholars, particularly again in the Indian subcontinent, they pointed to this verse as the phenomenon that is unfolding in terms of knowledge. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so nurihim ayatina, we will sh soon show them this scene that comes before the first word, the sanurihim. Soon we will show them ayatina, our signs, is a process in the future that's unfolding meaning it's 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 in a, a part of islamic epistemology yeah. we will so show them our we will show it's talking about a future time yeah so oh. nurihim ayatin are signs fil afaq in the horizons wa fi anfusihim and in themselves hatta until yatabayyana it is absolutely 100% clear annahum anna lahum yatabayyana lahum it is made clear to them that this is the truth. Now, there are a few important, interesting points. Sanuri him, we will show them, meaning not the Muslims. And uh, because then if it was Muslims, it would say, Sanuri kum, we will show you. Mm -hmm. So the really big signs come towards the end where, uh, where in another surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is interesting, if you look at the name of the surah, it'll shed light into how it's interesting because it's called the room the romans and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses these words uh for them uh on the same subject that we were talking about uh, so this is talking about the byzantine and that uh the the roman you can say the civilization or they know of the outer aspects, the obvious, the outward aspects of the dunya. Wahum and they are anil akhiratihum ghafilun, but they're heedless of the half hereafter till now. And then the next verse, if you alam yatafakaru fi anfusim, do they not look ponder upon their own creation? And whatever Allah has created in the heavens and the earth, and what is is in between, except in truth. So this similar, but the point I was making was many of the scholars said that it was destined for the West in this case, uh, particularly when he added with Sutur Rum, and it's talking about the Romans, that they would discover many of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's destined and I'll, I'll share with you why uh, they say this meaning what's really behind it um, until it is absolutely clear to them that this is the truth meaning Quran will unfold itself over time till the point that it becomes absolutely clear that this is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those people that are willing to engage the book of Allah and his creation. So the way, uh, for example, Dr. Israel would put it to us is that there can be no um, gap between the word of Allah and the work of Allah, meaning they have to be in harmony. You know, that, that, that's what uh, St. Thomas Aquinas said. Truth is one. You know, it's a, a basic principle of scholastic philosophy. And you know it's it's true that, that in the West now of course the, the the Byzantines had a great sense of the of the hereafter but what happened is you know in, in Western civilization including undoubtedly in Byzantium there began to be a split between the understanding of you know the signs on the horizons and the signs 
in this in the soul which pertained to the hereafter and and this only just grew and grew and grew until um what, what you had in the, in the west is of course the renaissance and the renaissance is the point where there was a, a real break between the drive to understand nature and how it worked and the 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 understanding of of god spirituality and the hereafter there was a split and what's different about the west and 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 the muslim world is is the church you know um catholic church perhaps in a uh in not the best way but at least you know the catholic church was understanding that um natural philosophy science technology worldly knowledge was departing from spiritual knowledge and fought against that for centuries mm -hmm. and so the uh, in in the catholic popes for example you you have a, a writings which show a very clear uh understanding of the problem with a a, a, a material or a scientific knowledge separated from spiritual knowledge what they were unable to do is really unite them again. They had, had simply, you know, said we believe in spiritual knowledge, and and this material knowledge is, you know, is becoming, uh, you know, evil, and so we reject it. But, but but they were unable to bring them together again. At least they recognized the problem, and mm -hmm. and 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 they were fighting a rear guard action against materialism for centuries, whereas. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, what the West had done with materialism broke in on Islam, you know, so abruptly, you know, like like with Napoleon, when Napoleon conquered Egypt, the, a, a total break, you know, that that was. And and then uh, I think the the only real and that was the beginning of 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 European colonialism, you know, in the in the Muslim world. And the, the only thing that's, I think, been co a comparable shock. Is something like the Internet, you know. I mean, you know, you're 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 living in, in in a society which which has only books and maybe there's a little radio and television, but it's mostly a, you know, a, a, a society that, that that is literate and you know, and then suddenly you have the internet and you have the availability of pornography to anyone who wants it. I mean, what a shock! What, what, whereas this was building up in in the West, we were creating it. It was building up slowly. We we were able to criticize it. As it was developing, but on the on the other hand, we became numb to it, so we didn't see how terrible it was. You know, both of those were going on, but at, at least it was a more gradual process because because we were we were creating it. But not, now, what has been created, you know, scientifically in the West it, it has been inherited by the whole world, and you have societies that did not participate in the creation of it. Suddenly, it's dumped on them, and 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 the, the situation is incredibly shocking. And, and de destabilize. Mm -hmm. So, part of uh, this, from the what some of the scholars uh, said, is that this was important in this sense, in in terms of knowing the truth, is that when this knowledge in what you know came. I don't know if you want to call it secular knowledge or how we want. Well, that, that's good enough. Yeah, secular. When this came in, it made one thing clear. So the way Iqbal sees it is that while it is taking us away from religion, but there is another aspect that's bringing humanity closer. And he said, well, at least we now know that the moon is in God. And there's no question yes. that these yes. planets. So, you know, yeah. you've come to La Ilaha. Uh, because of where humanity, it's fate and science. Fate and science brought humanity to la ilaha. And as these signs continue to exfoliate, they will take us to illallah. Well, you know, hopefully. And, you know, I, I wish I personally knew more a, a, about, you know, the, the steps that are being taken in that direction now. One, is, I think is, now what's happening. So I was saying what, what they said, right? So this is Iqbal yeah. speaking in the 1930s. Yes. Now what I see is that it's all the whole the whole it's not it's no longer the same epistemology. It's 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 changed. I mean now you can change your pronouns based upon what you feel rather than your chromosomes. I mean it's just Yeah, it's, I mean 
there, there is that kind of craziness, but also there, there is the idea of, for example, intelligent design, mm. which people like William Dembski and Michael Behe, or Behe, um, Behe, I guess it's pronounced, um, have come up with t t talking about the irreducible complexity of, um, of biological systems, which, which you know, are, have to have been designed in some way. They could not have developed by anything like chance, or or any anything like like a natural law that did not have an extremely specific thing to express and to say in terms of the structure of, of uh, DNA and, and, and many other things in, in the biological systems. And, um, you know, uh, lo look at, looking at biological systems in terms of information theory, you begin to see this is designed. This is not anything but designed. And, and, and then the question comes, who designed it? Well, uh, the UFO believers say, well, you know, it was designed by, by the UFO aliens. You know, that's that's the, the, the UFO belief that's coming in <coughs> to try to obscure and counter what the, the intelligent design researchers have discovered. Oh, well, it's we're simply genetic, a genetic experiment by the UFO aliens. And then you qu the question is, well, but who then who designed them and who designed the ones who designed them? And so this this in, in no way gets rid of, of what is a mystery in strictly materialistic terms of how this design happened. But what we're doing now is creating extremely complex systems like computers and things like this. And we look at this complexity and we, we don't think a computer just grew like a mushroom. You know, We know it was designed, right? Because we designed it. And then we look at, at uh, DNA and we're, we're already you know, talking about ways to use DNA in computing. Right, we're looking at DNA. Well, somebody designed this because it has every sign of this. And and so I, I notice people that that you know uh, claim to be materialists and and you know to not believe in God will still unthinkingly use the term. Well, the the the, the human body is designed to do da da da. Well, yeah, like okay. solar system, you know. Yeah, so who so, so who designed it? So so the, you know when you start to look at material structures in terms of information that's the point where you're beginning to say well you know that the the uh the universe is a book who wrote the book you know i mean that's and and that's that's so in line with 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 uh, you know islamic uh conceptions and, and and metaphysics the idea of the mother of the book perhaps the mother of the book is actually uh the universe considered as information you know and mm. and 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 a an edited version of that you know in in the arab tongue the clear arab tongue is the quran the book we know but the mother of the book is is the totality of information out of which reality is formed mm. and and uh, physics are getting to the point where they're they're looking at subatomic particles and such and such and they're saying we're not talking about actually pieces of stuff anymore we're talking about item you know items of information you know, and, and so so if matter, if reduced to, to its simpler and simpler or, or more and more elemental level is actually nothing but information, then we must ask, where did this information come from? Information is specific. It's not something there was a big bang and, and, and there was random explosions of energy and out of that. No, it's very specific. And the specific aspect of it is seen to yeah, go Yeah, and back. it happens to go from simple to more complex right so from uh, atoms to molecules molecules to organic to i mean from yeah. from non-living to living right so it's just like jumping to more complexity yeah of, but so the this. information that that is the template and, and, and that's yeah i mean it's, it's those developments had to all have already existed had to already exist in some dimension and and you're looking at the james webb telescope one of the recent recent discoveries you know so, i want to share with you on, on that yeah. point of yeah of of information right there's a terminology quran uses for the knowledge of allah as a book like i'll give you an example so uh so this idea of you know uh that allah subhanahu wa has everything recorded in a book 
like I'll give you one example in Quran that some scholars have debated over this issue. But uh Allahumma Sunni Ala Muhammad, yeah, I think it's here. Uh The, just this 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 just this verse there's many other okay ayah number 22 there's no difficulty that comes over you as humanity over the earth nor you as individuals except it's in a book before it happens now over here it's not referring to law al-mahfuz the mother book that you were referring to. Over here, the scholars say it's referring to the book is the knowledge of Allah itself. Meaning knowledge, I guess, I don't know if it's appropriate, probably not, because there's nothing like Allah. But when by the word kitab, we understand the idea of information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the, the knowledge of Allah is immediate and total, and 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 it, it can't be reduced to information. And yet, one of its later and lower level reflections is precisely information. Mm. You know, I mean, you 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 have if if we look at at existence hierarchically, you know, that the, then that when we can understand that, you know, uh, you, you can reduce <laughs> matter to information, and then information comes from from kun, you know, kun. Uh, you know, let it be, and 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 the knowledge of Allah is higher than information because it is one with His essence. It's not just something you know, information He's collected. You know, he, he it's it's information or knowledge that He is. If He is knowledge, then then He you know that's far beyond information. Yet, all information must come from it. All primary information that 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 we're beginning to see is behind uh, you know subatomic particles and material. You know, objects. So, talking about kun, this verse of the Quran, in amruhu, his his command is ida arada shay'an that when he wills something, he says to it, "Be and it is." Scholars have discussed this in many different ways, but one of the interesting points that caught my attention is he says to it, "Yes." That so caught the, my attention too, as if it already existed. Before as if it already exists. Yeah, right. And, you know, like Imam Shafi says that Allah is not literally saying be, 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 be. That's not what Allah is doing. That's just a metaphor for his irada, for his will. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so that, that's a long discussion. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we say he knows everything, this is a whole different level of knowing in a sense that now you're saying, which is a very interesting point, that as we look at the universe, it's like everything is like the DNA, right? It's it's like everything is has in it information. Uh and that can only be by uh design. Yeah, it can only be by design, but yet yeah, we we do not say, well, Allah possesses the biggest database in, in existence, and and uh, you know, and and He consults that when He wants to create something. It's beyond this, yeah. you know. I mean, because He 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 is His knowledge of Himself. There is no separation between His being and and His self knowledge, mm -hmm. and so you 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 have to understand that level when you're talking about real knowledge. But then. It, 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 everything has echoes. Everything you know has reverberations on lower levels, and at one point it does get down to what what science can determine is actual information and does you know it, by design. Mm -hmm. So and yeah, and you know th th those links those links science is just at the edge of being able to 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 talk at least talk about those links between what is beyond information and and the actual creation of information. You know, or the, or the manifestation of information. I'd like I'd like to know more about that research. You know, there there was a great uh, video about that on YouTube, which which I recently went back to look for. I couldn't find it. So, one of the things the scholars they said is that in the time of the Prophet, when somebody heard the Quran, it was the linguistic miracle that was the most 
immediate to its listeners. That when somebody heard the Quran, they were like, wow. Today, if you try to study the linguistics of Quran, you can appreciate it, but still not like somebody from that time. Plus, that takes a lot of time and effort and, yeah. you know, a lot of, uh, it's very hard to get to that point where you're like, wow, wowed by the literary aspect of the Quran, other than, of course, the recitation. Uh, that yeah, and, you know, and I don't know Arabic, and, you know, the only recitation of the Quran I do uh, you know, daily is is the uh, Surah al waqia you know, yeah. and but but it's, you know, as a poet, every once in a while, I suddenly hear the poetic uh, values of it, and I say, this is amazing, you know. I mean, it's it it ha it has so many, you know, it it is so profound and and and, and so well expressed in in, in poetic terms. Um, you know, I've, I've heard people say, well, it's a kind of a rhymed prose. No, it's a lot better than that. You know, it's it's it. And, and sometimes when when I've been reading poetry or reciting poetry and then the time comes for me to do my weird and I, and I, I do, you know, recite the Surah al waqiyah I'll suddenly hear it on, on a deeper level. I said, this is this is magnificent. You know, and I don't even know Arabic. I don't know what the words mean. But I'm just just talking about the. the, the uh, <coughs> The, the auditory quality of it. Hmm. So some of the scholars explained it this way, that in the time of Moses, the biggest art was magic. So he brought magic against magic. And then Isa, والسلام, the biggest art in his time was healing. So he brought healing as the biggest miracle. And then, of course, Quran being against poetry. But then it's converting into meaning the Quran itself as a book of knowledge is for this world that was going to be created. Today, I was talking to one brother, Imam Isa Woods, a uh, very interesting brother. May Allah bless him. Uh, he said something very interesting. He said that, you know, he feels when he's reading Quran that the Quran is almost talking to the world that we live in. First of all, because... This oh. is the largest population of Muslims that ever existed. So the Quran has to be, have come down very relevant to a time where the major, where humanity would be so much and Muslims would be so much. There's never been so many Muslims on earth. So, you know, he's saying when the Quran says, Ya Yuhan Nas, this is like, oh mankind, right? Or oh Muslims, this is like the first time that there's been so yeah. many Muslims. But I just, thought that comment of his was interesting, but this change from, or this, so, so, so when you look at Islamic, when you look at in terms of what Muslims considered the standard by which they would see the truth over time. So in the beginning, it was linguistics. Then in the first few centuries, like up till a little bit after the time of Imam Ghazali. So we're talking about six, seven centuries. If you read the literature, it seems like the standard was Allah gave the Prophet the victory and Islam spread everywhere. This was like a magnificent uh, phenomenon that happened in front of their eyes. You know, that how Islam spread in such a short time. And then after that, you know, Islam exerted uh, a certain power, a certain hegemony, which were for them, like Imam Ghazali writes this in his book, he says, look, the Prophet was giving victory, right? Like all the odds were against him and he still had victory. So that kind of like became a big point of like, this is the truth. Why is it the truth? Yeah, and and, and, and the, the, the ayat of the Quran would be heard as power, you know, Allahu Akbar, right? You know, yeah. that's Exactly. Not, not, yes. not necessarily the subtleties for everyone of what is actually being said, but the very fact that this book and, and you know, through the prophet who brought it carried the, the you know, in, in its in its essence, carried the power to produce this vast expansion of the Islamic world. And so, uh, so Iqbal says this, is that People had enough time to experience God because the Sheikh says, okay, start praying. 
So it's it wasn't an intellectual endeavor. It was a spiritual endeavor. And so the person has much more time. And he starts his dhikr and he starts reading Quran. And he's doing it every day for the next three, four, five years. And finally, he has a religious experience. And this religious experience was really one of the fortes that Imam Ghazali came to, right? That it is the it is not the sense data. It is it is your experience of knowing the truth, uh, this ma'rifa. And so, yeah, it's, it's not not even a lot of the intellectual subtleties, which may, you know, suggest the existence of ma'rifa, but they are not the the thing itself. They're echoes. You know? Yeah, and so. Iqbal is saying that, so in the beginning it was linguistics, then it was the victory of the Prophet, then it was a, a process by which any there were people in society, enough people in society, that went through the process of experiencing the unseen, experiencing Allah, experiencing the Prophet in their dreams, experiencing miracles even. Mm -hmm. And it was not uncommon because they had... You know, today a sheikh, the, I mean, one of the differences between today's sheikhs and before is that they were very strict and they were very much like, okay, uh, do, you, do you, what do you know? Do you already know your faraid? Do you already know your compulsory obligatory Islam? Do you, okay, are you reading Quran every day? Okay, you're already reading. Okay, now I'll take bayah from you, right? Now you're ready to like yeah. look on an journey to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, you had people in society, in every city, in every village, people, there was a concept of these, there are certain people that are close to Allah, and those people became proof of Islam's truth, in a yeah. sense. And those people did not have to be necessarily defined as Sufis, as apart from the rest of the Muslims. This is what you see in uh, Ibn al-Arabis, the, the, uh, the Sufis of Andalusia. Well, Sufis, but you know, as it were, everyone was a Sufi or everyone who was a Muslim. And some people were preeminent in, in one thing and some people in another. Some some people were deeply ascetic and some people, you know, had, had complete, uh, <coughs> you know, pr pr practice of, of zikr from, you know, from morning till night and in their in their sleep and dreams. And other people did other things. And, you know, it was a rich environment when, in, in, in which in which truth was the same truth was taking many different forms but they were not opposed to each other mm -hmm. they, they they enriched the, the entire field and so even Arabi, if which is probably something we cannot do today as easily he could go from teacher to teacher to teacher and like a bee going from flower to flower picking up nectar and 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 uh you know you know come to a very comprehensive and and vast understanding of, of the religion and, and of reality whereas Nowadays, if we go from teacher to teacher, we're going to get it. You know, we're going to get this kind of teaching, and then another teaching that seems to contradict it, and, and then you know, and, and we're going to split ourselves into a million pieces because we don't have that unity of of, of the teaching environment that mm. we used to have. So, and so, Iqbal feels that this carried Islam, like just as one example. Uh, Nizamuddin Aulia, who was responsible to bring Islam into the Indian subcontinent. Now they had the kings. Now these kings were kings. They were that's what they were. They were monarchs. Yeah. But when they went into battle, they would still come to the presence of these people and say, Can you do dua for us? We're about to go to battle. <laughs> you know, and 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 there would be uh whether it's true or not, but it still sheds light into the type of thought process they had you know Nizamuddin Oliya said well you know I, I had a vision that you're going to win this battle everything will be fine and they won the battle so this is you know so they were people that close to Allah is one way to take it or just take it for whatever it is but it's still representative of that time yeah. and even even the the big shots the, the the monarchs had to come to the doors of these people because they believed that they had a spiritual power, a closeness to Allah, and they were proof. And so then Iqbal says, so Iqbal is saying that you no longer really have the time to go through this long process 
and get to know Allah. It's no longer sufficient in our times, is, is basically what he was saying. He was saying now you have to dive into the Quran and you have to get to a certain point intellectually before your journey of ma'rifa is meaningful. That's kind of what Iqbal was saying. And so Iqbal was like, well, you first have to get to know the message of Quran in the light of... Excuse me, my, my wife is now phoning. And, uh, that's, okay. To... that's okay. Hello. Okay, well, uh, uh, my last sheikh who did fall on hard times but had some good things to say would say you 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 don't you don't understand the Quran by trying to figure it out. You know, there's a degree of marifa which comes from you know spiritual practice in zakr, which which is the key to opening the door of the Quran. You know, which I th I think that I think that's true to a large degree. And yeah, we don't have time. I mean, uh, um, it it ha you know the the, the 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 truth has to come to us whole. And, and immediately, and then we we may have time to unpack what has come to us, but we don't have time to build up to it in the same way. That's that's true, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I remember, you know, I, I don't I don't necessarily support this way of doing things, but but you know, some of the Sufis who first uh, came to the West, you know, like uh, Hazrat Inayat Khan or uh, Samuel Lewis, Sufi Sufi Sam. Who was supposedly, you know, he, he was he had a Chishti initiation, but also a lot of other Sufi orders, and um, he, he is described as the first Sufi master, the first Sufi sheikh born in the West, which oh. could be true. Um, you know, came from my my mm -hmm. home area of Marin County, California. Uh, but you know, th th they would tend to say, "Well, we'll we'll just we'll teach Sufism directly to you know in in uh, in a." Uh, Hazar, in, in Ayat Khan's time, you know, it was the seekers of the time. Uh, some of them would be from the theological <laughs> society and people like that. And and in Sufi Sam's time, it was the hippies. You know, we'll teach you teach it directly to the hippies. And who, you know, God willing, you know, inshallah, maybe they will become Muslims somewhere down the road. You know, but we're going to give them the whole truth now because we don't have time, perhaps, to do it any other way. Now there are problems with that approach, and it created. You know a, a lot of hybrid, you know, semi Sufism, which which uh, you know n n was never going to reach the stature of traditional Sufism because it did not, you know, understand Quran and did not understand, you know, did not follow Sharia, and and so th th there was a great deficiency there. But I still see why some of them took that attitude, mm. right or wrong. Because of what what Iqbal said, we don't have the same time, and you know about the Quran being, um, you know, written as much for or or if not more for our time than it was, you know, for and it was written for all times. It was it, or it, it was it was uh, sent for all times, but uh, it it has a great relevance to our times. I just look at at the the last surah, the surah al Nas, which says remember worship you know the, the, the king of mankind the lord of mankind mm -hmm. the god of mankind yeah not um you know in other words man is the central humanity is is the central recipient of the quran you know god did not send the quran to the jinn Although you know they 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 are, they are supposed to follow it, but it was you know the prophet that it was sent to was not a jinn, and or, or to the animals or, or to or to the elements or or to the heaven and the earth and the hills, as it says in, in the Quran itself. But it was sent to, to humanity. We have to understand that humanity is central and preeminent. Otherwise, we will be tempted to to reject the human form, hmm. and we have many ways of rejecting the human form now. You know through transgenderism through transhumanism and God knows what else is coming along, you know, where, well, it isn't important to be human beings, you know, if I, if I, if I want to uh, change my genetic structure and become, you know, uh, an, partly an animal with superpowers of an animal, I could do that. And I, so, you know, throwing away the human form was recognized as a danger 
you know, and as a temptation, you know, of, of the sneaking whisperer who whispers in the hearts of mankind of the jinn and of mankind. And so that's why that's the last surah of the Quran, because that that is the last temptation of mm. the human race for this cycle of time. You mm. know, so the, the 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 Quran is extremely relevant for that reason. But one thing I just I want to end, and we're in the middle here, so we can because th there's there there are a bunch of uh, themes and the stuff I sent you that, that we could deal with. But let me since, since you um, quoted, you know, I will show. We will show them our signs on the horizons and in themselves until they are convinced that this is the truth. Isn't it enough for you that I am um, witness over all things? Yes. Yes. One of the things that that, that suggested to me, and of course, th these, you know, I have, uh, <coughs> have many, many different applications on many different levels. That that's the levels that can be understood on are almost inexhaustible but there's a short thing here it's only three paragraphs and let me just read it it's a talking about the anthropic principle is that in the uh, pages you sent me uh yeah it, it's there but it's the last one and it's only three paragraphs so is it the last page yeah it is okay let me just go yeah on. and i've got it here but if you want to show it on your screen that would be easier the last three paragraphs oh, okay the entropic realism in Quran. Okay, very interesting, mashallah. Yeah, so it says, the strong anthropic principle states that the universe as a whole is expressly designed and fine-tuned to produce beings such as ourselves, beings who are capable of witnessing and understanding. Mm. Isn't that strange? The universe, you know, produces, you know, ultimately a being who can see it as a universe. Hmm. An animal doesn't see it as a universe. He sees just his his part of it and, and, and the things he needs to know to survive, and to, like many of us, That's right. to only see it that way. But the human being is capable at our best of seeing it as a cosmos, as a complete order. You know? hmm. So uh, producing beings capable of witnessing and understanding it. This principle, however, begs the question, if the human mind is designed to know the universe, how can we be sure that the universe is not simply a creation or a figment of that mind? If the brain can be shown to the, be the medium of all experience, everything goes through our brain or is some in some cases produced by our brain, you know, uh, based upon, you know, we expect to see something and then we see it. And a lot, you know, there's a lot of, been a lot of experiments on that, this kind of thing. Uh, a fig, uh, how can we say, be sure that the universe is not just a figment of that mind. If the brain can be known to be the medium of all experience, how can we be sure that the world around us is not simply a phantom of that brain? And that's one of the things that science, as it goes crazy in the West and now elsewhere, is beginning to say that there is no actual reality, that, that uh, you know, it, 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 everything is, is a phantom of our consciousness. We're living in a simulation or, you know, uh, Human consciousness has a magical way of changing reality on the quantum level and all these things, which which really have been well, those are ideas that have been well criticized by people mm. like Wolfgang Smith, if anybody wants to check it, what he's doing on the web. But anyway, there's that tendency of saying uh, there are no real signs on the horizons. It's only us. Mm. You know, th th there are signs in us. But whatever our, our consciousness is is determinative of everything, and everything out there it can't even be proved to exist, which is incredibly destructive to both religion and society and human relations and everything else you can imagine to think of things that way, because it makes everybody yeah uh, <coughs> meaningless, everybody a little god, you know, yeah. which is really yeah bad. that too yes everyone <laughs> becomes a little god and the whole purpose of existence is meaningless it's meaningless right but on the other hand we have infinite power except we don't seem to be able to use it very well but if we could only figure out how we could create you know reality just the way god you know is supposed supposed to have done then we'll be in great shape but we never we never quite seem to get there so anyway and it says the this question which is being quote seriously posed today by certain mentally imbalanced individuals including scientists is easily dealt with. To say brain is to say physical object. 
If the brain is a physical object, a component of a physical body, then the physical body is real. If the physical body inhabits a universe of physical objects, then the physical universe is real. The physical brain can no more be a mental projection of itself than a rock can be its own creator. Mm. On the other hand, this physical universe can never be proved to have existence apart from our consciousness of. This, however, does not indicate that our consciousness creates it, only that consciousness and its physical object, which are never found apart, are the polarized manifestations of a greater reality. Mm. So the physical object is signs on the horizons. Consciousness is the signs in ourselves. Yes. And the greater reality is Allah, who is the witness over all things over both. In the words of Allah, as recounted in the Holy Quran, we shall show them our signs on the horizons, the outer world, and within themselves, until they are assured that this is the truth. Mm. Doth not thy Lord suffice thee, since he is over all things the witness? Mm. And does not create the universe via mental causality, nor does the universe create him via physical causality. Mm. Allah, as the witness over both, creates both. As Plotinus would say in his Enneads, by contemplating them. Plotinus said, you know, the, the, the one, you know, manifests the universe by contemplating the potential of that universe within it. Something like that. Hmm. As Fritjof of Schoen succinctly puts it, the world may be a dream, or as we would say today, a simulation, but it is not my dream. <laughs> you know, and and that's that, that's the, the the metaphysic I get I get from from those verses. You know, and and that's um, you know that's essentially anthropic realism. We in the universe are perfectly matched. You know, and traditionally, we, it said we are the, the microcosm of the macrocosm. Everything that's in the universe, in in in, in you know, in in, a, in the large sense, expanded in everything, is also hidden within us. You know, and and uh, that's what why we say that the the human being alone is created on all the names of God. All the names of Allah are manifest in the human form. That's what it means to say we possess the trust, the aman, all form, you know, and, and animals are, you know, like, let's say each animal is one name of Allah, or each angel is one name of Allah. What's interesting here, in the in, in Genesis, in, in the Old Testament, it said Adam named the animals, whereas mm -hmm. in the Quran, it says, if you, you want to read it that way, uh, um, Adam named the angels, told the angels their names. Mm -hmm. So these are strictly equivalent. You know, and they're they're saying the same thing on different levels. The the, the connection is strangely enough is is an, an, like Native American spirituality where the animals are considered almost to be as angels. You know that that, that they are they, they are beings who exist beyond humanity, and, and and they were created before humanity, and and so they become messengers of the great spirit to humanity. This is what you know the animals or the animal spirits are seen as in a lot of Native American uh, religion, and and that's pretty much what the Quran is. Saying. Quran mm -hmm. also says well, something that that any you 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 would think came from a Native American source, you know that 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 what whatever you, you know flies on wings or or walks on two feet or on four feet, you know th these are peoples just like you. The animals are peoples just like you. That's what. You know, if if you show that quote to anyone and say where that come from, they'd say it came from the Lakota Indians. You know, well, it came from the Quran. So, so. yeah, that's right, mashallah. Well, well I, 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 I do want to go, but you know, we can if you want to just not read twenty four pages, but just look at that that second because the first the first section about uh, natural law in the Quran is just saying. You know, I could deal with that pretty easily. It's just saying, you know, there is natural law in the Quran. It, it's, it, the Quran talks about natural law. And so the Asherite idea that, which is also a profound idea and on another level, that Allah recreates the universe in each instant on each occasion, That's does right. not negate the idea of natural law. You know, it's, it's, so I'm talking about that. But the second thing is tafsir of the natural world. And you can just read, you know the the, the uh, section headings and get an idea of 
what what I see the Quran is saying about the natural world, because the natural world, what is said about the natural world, the natural world, the Quran is the basis of all science, mm. because uh, our, our understanding of the natural world is where science comes from. We forgot that. Mm. We think that technology is a kind of nature unto itself, you know, a second nature, and we don't even have to refer to, to nature anymore. We may control it or maybe we may worry that it's getting out of control, but we don't look at it in the same way as saying these are the signs of Allah and the terrestrial world. And so the natural law, natural laws that we see within the natural world uh, are also saying something about their creator. We don't see it that way anymore. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. You know, the fact the sun and the moon are following a a definite pattern that can yeah. be even calculated mathematically is not the fact that the universe is following laws meaning Allah's laws is is never seen as or not anymore at least uh as anything i don't know what word to use significant or they don't they don't connect it with the idea of god Right. No, and, and if you don't connect it with the idea of God, you finally will say, "Well, do these laws really have to? Maybe they, maybe they change over time. Maybe, uh, you know, in, in earlier cases, <laughs> the material laws are di were different, or maybe in a, in a parallel universe, all the physical laws are different, or yeah. maybe they're even changing now. Maybe the constants aren't a constant. The speed of light may change, or the Planck distance, whatever the constants are, may change. And so, what you have." What is what you have is um, uh, science deconstructing itself mm -hmm. right there because without natural law, you know what we used to think. We used to look at at the stars and their beauty and and their regularity and the regularity of the planets and say, you know, this is is a, is a beautiful system that is constantly you know changing but constantly the same and and this, this is is you know. You know, sh shows shows forth the, the wisdom and the power, you know, and, and the mercy of Allah. We would see that. We look up, and, and now, when, when when we think of the universe, I mean, I look at YouTube, and everything is saying James Webb Webb Telescope has, has made a terrifying discovery of a huge disaster happening in space, and it could affect us. Oh my God! You know, and and we're afraid of the universe now. We used to consider it to 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 be, you know, the 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 beautiful articulated system, you know, of order and beauty in which Allah has placed us. And now we think it's our enemy, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and if, if, if there's a gamma ray burst or, or, or a nearby, you know, supernova, we're toast and it can happen, it could happen. And here comes the asteroid mm -hmm. to destroy us like we deserve, you know. And, and so the whole feeling in a very short time of, of, of what the cosmos is, has changed and we're we're afraid of it you know which is unfortunate that that that, that the reason we're afraid of it is is because we've rejected Allah and we don't quite realize we've rejected Allah or see the import of it and we're afraid of the consequences and we don't even know that but that that's is it. so 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 absolutely magnificent statement you just made I think at, a, at what Carl Jung would call the collective consciousness, right? Yeah. Uh, that's what's kind of happening is that because we've let go of Allah, we, we have become, I don't know, suicidal or... Suicidal is, is, is a good word, yeah. You know, and I think that we it, it's like a person who is in a, in that state of mind doesn't even know where to begin to get himself out of it yeah everything is frightening you know and, and everything is threatening other people are threatening you know plants and animals and, and microbes are threatening stars are threatening <laughs> and, you know, there's no way there's nowhere to turn. there's this a poem what by uh, was it was it it was um uh, you know, why don't I remember her name? She's a very famous poet, but 
uh, she has this line, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world, you know, which in recent years, perhaps legitimately has been seen as a kind of a Pollyanna attitude, you know, as if God is, you know, is, is, is simply going to uh, be totally indulgent to whatever we want to do. But imagine that, that, that sense, people had that sense. They had a sense of basic security mm -hmm. because, and you'd hear people say this, even if they weren't deeply religious, say, well, you know, the, the, the man upstairs is running things and, you know, I'm just going to put things in his hands. And then they, they don't even think about mm. how, how profound it is to say that. And, and certainly we don't feel that way now. So just going back before we wrap up for today, because I know you have to go. Um, so in the beginning, it was the Quran, the linguistics, and then at the collective conscious level in the Muslim world, it became like, well, the Prophet got his victory that he was promised. Wow. And then it was the Oliya Allah. But in this whole time period, discovery of nature and what I guess Kant called the moral law within, right? People mm -hmm. were more aware of this fitrah, that there is something in me that says this is right and this is wrong. Yeah. And and looking at nature and the creation of Allah and Muslims, they couldn't even imagine looking at the sky and thinking of anything other than Allah. Right. Yeah. And and so now, boom, you know, technology comes in, questions God generation after generation. And we're talking about almost 200 more, almost 300 years of that. Question mark on God, question mark on God. And here we are in that suicidal state that you were mentioning. But with yeah, there's, there's a wonderful quote from the Seven Pillars of Wisdom. And if it takes too long to find it, I will let you go and let myself go. But let me see. This is a quote, which would be nice to end with, because uh, uh, it, it speaks to what we're saying. It's you know by T. E. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, from his book The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, and uh, he and some of his Bedouin companions at arms are resting at night, looking up at the sky in the desert, and goes like this, Nasir, who's the Sharif of Medina, rolled over in his, on his back with my glasses, with his binoculars, and began to study the stars, counting aloud first one group and then another, crying out with surprise at discovering little lights not noticed by his un unaided eye. Hmm. Auda set us on to talk of telescopes, of the great ones, and of how man in 300 years had so far advanced from his first essay, from his first attempt, that now <laughs> he built glasses as long as a tent through which he counted thousands of unknown stars. Hmm. We slipped into talk of suns beyond suns, sizes and distances beyond wit. What will now happen with this knowledge, asked Muhammad. We shall set to, and many learned and some clever men together will make glasses as more powerful than ours as ours than Galileo's. Mm. And yet more hundreds of astronomers will distinguish and reckon yet more thousands of now unseen stars, mapping them and giving each one its name. When we see them all, there will be no night in heaven. <laughs> it just moves me, man. <laughs> when we see them all, there will be no night in heaven. Why are Westerners always wanting all, provokingly said Auda. Behind, behind our few stars, we can see God, who is not behind your millions. Mm. We want the world to end, Auda, says Lawrence. But that is God's complaint, Zah. But how true that is. Mm. Uh, Auda says, behind our few stars, we can see God, who is not behind your millions. We want the world to end, Auda, says Lawrence. How oh, true. Wow. SubhanAllah. And so now when 
you know, in that age uh, where I was growing up, science and Quran, again, like in the time of the Prophet, where it started out linguistic, now it's Quran and and the universe, in a sense. It was a very powerful thing. But I think now Shaytan has thrown a trick out of his bag of tricks, uh, which is to derail science and to derail that connection. Yeah, he used, he used science in the West to, to derail religion. And now, of course, he's going to derail science as well. You know. And so people are now confused. They, they have no measurement by which they can. There's no epistemology by which you can say. I mean, Quran's the only book that says, look over, I mean, outside itself, right? So like every scripture is like within itself in a sense. But the Quran is like, oh, look at the yes. sun and look That's at the moon. Correct. That's a very interesting, you know, perspective that, that, that I, I didn't necessarily, you know, come to. But you're it, entirely right. Yeah. You know, the Quran's like, oh, read your books and read that. And so all these different forms, like that is Quran authenticating an epistemology in a sense. Yeah, yeah. You know. Uh, uh, so, so do you not see it the camel how we created it so there's like this kind of like there's an authentication that is true like you can know something true by that yeah, and, the stars, and, and the winds and, and the rock strata and all of the, the you know natural yeah. objects that appear in the Quran I mean Quran's the only book that's like you're in it but it throws you outside it in a sense it's like yeah. There's a little of that, for example, in the book of Job, you know, where... Uh, right, it's probably definitely there in the Bible to some degree. I have no doubt because of its origin. But it, it's it's not so comprehensive and, and so upfront, you know, so... Okay, well, Jill, we can end at... You can have the last word. We can end well, and we'll continue last, next week. if last word is, is, I'll see you next week, inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah, inshallah. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Okay, well, I like him so much.